Good morning. Good morning. I thought Super Bowl Mondays were an office phenomenon, whereby people call in sick the day after the Super Bowl. But I see that even the university is pretty much there. I appreciate the fact that you came, that you were on time. Today, I'm going to review together with you briefly the plans for this week, the fourth of the semester. We'll touch upon the assignments, and then we'll spend this morning reading from the prints and analyzing, discussing the first three sections of this book. Not a very long book. The letter where Machiavelli is dedicating the prints to a member of the Medici family, and chapters one and two. We are trying to extract from the style and the contents of those texts ideas that confirm, at least in fact, the model, the schema of the view of power by Machiavelli. And that's why we will try to pass the words of Machiavelli through a very fine calm. Because even something as ordinary, trivial, banal, like the letter of education, really reveals a lot about Machiavelli's mindset. And the style anticipates the kind of approach that Machiavelli will utilize when talking about various historical events and various political scenarios. So you see on the screen what I added under week four, and I added more for week five, weeks five and six, but they're not complete. This is something that we will discuss, the assessment of the Machiavellian nature of cons or scans. That is the focus of the first written assignment, which is due Friday of this week, and you find it here at the end of week three. As I said before, we haven't worked on this together, but we will do that on Wednesday so that you can better prepare, be better prepared for the assignment, which is you on Friday, and the way you post the assignment is that you create a Google Docs file and you share it with me, giving me the right to comment and edit the text. You will use the same Google Docs file for the next couple of written assignments. There won't be too many. And eventually, you will be using this Google Docs file also for the final project. This way, even when your project is in the stage of a draft, you can invite me to review the file and I'll store the links of the file you send me, you shared with me, and I'll be able to quickly add comments or make quick corrections if necessary, like typos or simple stylistic changes. Naturally, after Wednesday, after the discussion of the cons, if you feel that you're still not completely ready for this first assignment, that you need to schedule a meeting with me, and you might not have time between Wednesday and Friday, simply email me requesting a short extension, but please do that professionally, do that before the deadline if you need to. So this that you find here is a list, a short list of tricks and scams picked among those 
that you find in long list inside the page evaluating Machiavellian games and I will analyze myself a couple of them in class and mention the others. As you see here under A, I have added a page to support my class this morning where I simply reorganized the text of Machiavelli's The Prince with a few notes, but my idea was to let you into the understanding of the structure, of the logical, of the complex structure that even a simple text such as the letter placed at the beginning of The Prince is based on. On Wednesday, the idea would have been to spend time introducing Robert Greene's The 48 Laws of Power from 1998, which is by far the most significant and one of the most successful books based on Machiavelli's theories. As I said before, I still have to go through the analysis of cons and scams, so that will probably absorb most of the class on Wednesday, which is why I will just introduce Robert Greene's text this Wednesday, and then I will continue next Wednesday, Wednesday of week five. On Friday, as you could expect, there too I adjusted the schedule. We will finish watching Little Caesar, complete the analysis of that film, and it'll be only on Friday of week five, next week, that we will start talking about and watching scenes from The Godfather, part one. As usual, YouTube videos of every lecture will be posted. Make sure you watch them as soon as possible if you miss a class. The assignments at the end of this week that you find here are just readings, in fact, I still have to add a couple of additional readings. As you see here, you find uh, the dedicatory letters and chapters from the prints up to number five, which is not a large amount of text. And I would, like, I would add at least one short article on Little Caesar and probably the first reading from the other textbook, Machiavellian. Okay? No written assignments, you, moving on, and you have one due this Friday. This that you find here is a reproduction of a page from the prints from the 1540 edition of the works by Machiavelli, published and distributed by famous Venetian printer Aldo Manuzio. And he's one of the inventors of italics. As you can see, he loved it. And as I said, what I've done in here is simply to break up the text, right? Analysis, the word analysis from the Greek means to break down. And I've tried to break down the text into its logical steps to make you see more clearly that what may seem a boring and predictable series of passages really hides the same kind of mindset that you will find at work through the rest of the book, through the rest of the prints. And you find that even this simple text, this simple letter where Machiavelli is writing to an aristocrat, a member of the Medici family who eventually will become the head of the city of Urbino, of the duchy of Urbino, where to this day you find this incredible palace, the Palace of the Dukes, which is now a museum. Even for this text, Machiavelli will imply certain things, such as you can never say always and you can never say never. 
there are always exceptions. You can only try to achieve something close to perfection, but never be perfect. Always look at the context. Always consider the specific circumstances of a context, of the context of an action, a game, a political practice, a political strategy. So even while offering this book as a gift to the prince, he will add a lot of specifications about him, about the aristocrat Lorenzo who's accepting, who's supposed to accept this gift. Later on, he will introduce a famous metaphor whereby Machiavelli says, how can I, somebody with such a low standing in society, really pretend that I can explain politics of the highest level to a leader, right? You practice leadership. I'm not a leader. Who am I to teach you about leadership? And the metaphor he introduces in the second page of The Prince to explain his daring is the map maker. And this is a science that was being developed during the time. For example, when Machiavelli was in Emilia Romagna, north of Florence, during the year 1502, during the same period, Leonardo da Vinci was in the area, the famous Leonardo, working for Cesare Borgia. If you remember, Machiavelli was sent there as a diplomat and almost as a spy to really try to understand what the next moves of Cesare Borgia would be, whether Cesare Borgia, who at the time was a lukewarm ally of Florence, would in fact turn into an enemy and move his army of really skilled, well-trained mercenaries across the Apennines and down to the plain of Florence. During the same period, Leonardo was working for this uh, uh, leader, Cesare Borgia, making maps with new techniques. And the new technique would imply, of course, to find a high vintage point and then use the science of perspective to render what you see from that vintage point into a flat, bidimensional view of the territory. And Machiavelli, borrowing from the practice of a map maker, says the same way that in order to draw a map of the plain, you go on the highest point. And in order to draw a map of the mountains, you have to be at the bottom of the mountains, on, in, in, inside the plains, in the same way, if you want to understand leaders, you need to be a citizen, a subject, someone at lower standing. And vice versa, if you want to understand citizens, you need to be a leader. You need to be at a higher point in society which is just another way of saying that in order to understand a situation, in order to understand a process, such as the process of leadership, you have to be outside of the context. You have to be able to have a point of view that embraces the whole context, which can only be obtained by placing yourself outside of that context. However, keep this in mind that the same way that there are no universal truths, that everything is relative to the context, there is no positive or negative. There is no absolute positive or absolute negative. Some, something, some kind of practice or strategy can be positive because it will further the achievement of a goal in a given situation. But if you change the ecosystem, if you change the circumstances, the same strategies could be deleterious, could be damaging, which helps us understand that Machiavelli never advocated just for the use of evil and deceit. Evil and deceit is the specific answer 
to a specific set of circumstances. And if you change those circumstances, then being evil, so to speak, is damaging. It is a loser's strategy. But the same way that there are no universal truths, even the contexts themselves are not fixed. That is to say, whenever you want to approach the search for the solution to a political crisis or the best way to achieve a political goal, first and foremost, you have to define the context of the game. What is the ecosystem? So even what Machiavelli says, there is the context of leadership, the place in society where leaders compete with each other or compete with the community trying to control society in general. And there is the context of society where citizens compete with each other and also interact with the leadership. These are just the contexts that you need to define and observe in a certain kind of intellectual scenario. But there are countless contexts that you can establish within society. And countless contexts that leaders will find themselves in. There is only one context for leaders, one context for citizens, or one context that includes both the leaders and society. Even contexts are the result of a dynamic process whereby you define the context based on the nature of the crisis that you need to provide a solution for, or based on the nature of the goal of the outcome that you want to produce, that you want to achieve, okay? Always keep that in mind. The other consequence of approaching everything through the definition of very specific context, which are always a subset of reality, is that within a context, the game, the practice, the strategy is well defined and you can set very fine parameters to define what is success within that context. But once you step out of that context, once you understand and realize that each specific context is not absolute, is not embracing everything, is not universal, is not covering everything, then you also understand that from the outside, where there is more, you can always have a different point of view. And therefore, in reference to the so-called recommendations by Machiavelli to princes to be evil, to be deceitful, to be murderers, to, to become murderers, if necessary, traitors, if necessary, etc. You have to understand that you can be the hero, you can be the winner within the context that requires that kind of evil practices, but that context is limited, and everyone who's not in the context can still apply their parameters to your behavior. Which means that the prince who practices evil behaviors in order to win, and does that out of necessity because he has to do that, because that is the most effective Maybe not the only solution, but the most effective solution or the solution that given the time available can be set up and executed. That is to say, there might be a better solution, a solution that is, is more honest or more pure, but you don't have time to set it up. You don't have time to execute it because Every context is limited, not only in terms of space, but also in terms of time. Well, even when you have to be evil in order to produce, guarantee an outcome, a predictable and repeatable outcome, 
you're still subject to the judgment of others outside of the context. If you believe that there is God, there is hell, or if people outside the context believe such things, you will go to hell. So there is also a kind of tragic side to the play, to the game of evil in Machiavelli. Machiavelli is not saying be evil and forget about it, forget your conscience, forget anything else. Machiavelli is saying within a given context, evil may be the only practical and reasonable answer. However, if you or anyone else around you believes in God and hell, you will go to hell. Because Machiavelli is not giving you the key to life. He's trying to give you the key to that game, that context, which does not eliminate everything around it. It's just saying, for a moment, if you want to win, only take into consideration whatever will produce the outcome and the goal you need to produce and achieve. Because anything else would be irrelevant. Because even if you brought God or morality or religion into it, since you know that your competitors and adversaries might not do the same, in terms of game theory, your strategy would become a losing strategy. Within the game, you just consider everything that exists and is relevant in that context. However, once you step outside of that context, there are things that become relevant again. And you might be a prince who is religious, who believes in God, and you have to carry this burden, the burden of this conscience, of your conscience, of, of the sins that you have committed. Only you did it because you have a responsibility towards the citizens, towards the state, towards the society that placed you in a position of leadership and the only way to guarantee their safety, to guarantee goals such as the preservation of independence, autonomy. Think of Italy during the 1500s with dozens of different city-states or regional states, with the only big states being southern Italy, or the, called also the Kingdom of Naples, which is about 40% of the territory of Italy and everything else subdivided in areas, political states often smaller than a single region, and there are 20 of them in Italy with a, a surface, an area that overall is less than California, okay? So keep that in mind, even when we talked about Chapelletto and the first novella of the Decameron, of course, within the context of the novella, Chapelletto is the hero, wins the day. But that doesn't completely erase the fact that he is the opposite of saint. He may be the Antichrist. And therefore, Chapelletto, within that context, is there is no denying the hero, the winner. But once you step outside of the context, well, if you believe in hell, of course Chapelletto will go to hell. If you believe in morality, of course you can say that Chapelletto was immoral or amoral, that he was cynical, right? That he was a terrible man. Yeah, the, those two things, are not in contradiction. They simply reflect different points of views and different contexts. Within the limited context of the game played by Chapelletto with the priest, he's the winner. But that game, that context, is not the totality of life. It's not the totality of society. And once you step outside, 
or look, observe the game from the outside, then your judgment, your assessment of the characters will, no doubt, change and will be justified. And really, the best way to understand the culture of humanism and the Renaissance is the existence of these contradictions without feeling the need, the urge to reconcile them. Medieval culture is about reconciling all differences under one theory, and that theory, that umbrella, would be, of course, religion, Christian religion. Everything has to be connected to God, and God should be the foundation of everything, and God allows you to have a unified view of everything. So even when someone like the character of Dante in Canto V of the Inferno experiences a split in his mind between, oh, I feel so strongly, I feel such an empathy with Francesca because Francesca is so romantic and her love was so passionate. Yes, she betrayed her husband. She had an affair, she committed a sin, but I feel for her, I really understand her. And, and on the other side of this split, God, I know that God and the Bible say this sin cannot be forgiven and therefore, or wasn't forgiven because they died before repentance and reconciliation and confession, therefore they deserve to be in hell. There might be the appearance of a split, but in the end, Paolo and Francesca will spend eternity in hell. There is finally a reconciliation. You can experience momentarily the contradiction, but the contradiction needs to be resolved, and the resolution is, of course, in favor of God in the case of Dante and the Divine Comedy. In the case of Machiavelli, in the case of Renaissance culture, contradictions become the essential nature of society because the universal statements, the universal values, the universal behaviors and practices, the universal truths of the Middle Ages turn into a fragmented view of the truth. Truth is what is justified within a context from a certain point of view, but it might be partially or completely in contrast with how things appear from a different point of view. So the truth of historiography is not the same truth that medicine practices and acknowledges, or the science and the philosophy of politics, or theology, etc. In fact, you just look at one of the typical genres of the intellectual pursuits during the 15th and the 16th century, and that is the genre of the dialogue, where fictionally the author imagines that some of the historical figures, some of the most famous intellectuals from that period, Machiavelli himself wrote a dialogue, get together in some kind of villa, usually, or, or nice setting to discuss society to discuss behavior. Il Cortigiano, the courtier, would be an example, a treatise in the form of a dialogue on how a court, the ideal member of the court should behave, how they should dress, how they should walk, dance, talk, etc. In these dialogues, the various characters reflect different viewpoints, different ideas on the topic of their conversation. Yet, usually, by the end of the dialogue, there is no resolution. There is no conclusion where some of the arguments are defeated and one emerges as victorious, as the winning argument, as the only acceptable position, or there is some kind of synthesis of different viewpoints so none of the characters is completely right, but the author will present 
the final and, and most convincing thesis about the topics of the debates. No, oftentimes the various arguments are, are hanging with no need to reconcile them and provide the truth. Because there is an understanding that each argument is justified, at least in part. That each argument is legitimate within a particular set of values, within a particular intellectual context. Okay? So let's look at the style of Machiavelli. Of course, I don't have time to go through everything with you, but we'll do some of this together, and then you can practice trying to read this, and as I said before, I've simply unpacked, I've disassembled the text, giving me levels and sub-levels, because I'm trying to follow the various branches of Machiavelli's logical reasoning, and I'm trying to direct your focus on the various modifications, on the various specifications, whereby Machiavelli, instead of going straight to the point, is always adding some kind of modifying clause, or a clause where it specifies where I, being the kind of man that I have, this book being the kind of book that it is, this situation, this transaction, me offering the book to you, Lorenzo the Medici, being what it is, given the circumstances, those are the conclusions. But of course, the premise, the implication, is that if you change the circumstances, then the logical process and its conclusion will change. Which is, from the very first two pages, the very opposite of any political treatise from the Middle Ages, where you're trying to cast a light on something that is the essential, universal truth of politics, right? You're trying to uh, uh, lift the veils and understand what is the core, the essence of politics once and for all, right? Not something that changes based on the circumstances. So this is the first part of the letter. What happens normally? This is part of a regular practice during the Middle Ages, during this period of the Renaissance, and even later on for the next 200 years. You dedicate a book to some kind of important person for one reason or another. The two most common reasons are, as in the case of Machiavelli, you offer the book to an aristocrat because you want them to pay for the publication. The printer will not be an investor. The printer will not put in the money hoping to recover the money and generate profit from the sale of a book. Also because this is a period where copyright law is just being established. By the 1530s, there will be the first uh, uh, trials to establish uh, copyrights of the authors and their descendants. But otherwise, yes, you can publish a book and the book can be successful. Usually you run it, the, the normal print for this period is 300 copies, 500 copies, 1,000 when it is really a bestseller of 1500. And then you go through a series of reprints. However, you understand very well that, especially in a place that is politically so fragmented, such as Italy, anyone in a different state, especially, can get a copy and reprint it. So a book that is printed in Florence can be reprinted in Venice. And they won't pay a dime to Machiavelli or his descendants and how can you sue someone across the borders? How can someone from Florence sue a printer in Venice when Venice is a completely different state, right? So the idea is I offer this book to you, you put in the money that is required for the book to be printed. Or in other cases, I offer you 
such an important person socially and politically. This book to invoke your protection so that no one should criticize the book too harshly because by doing so they would irk the person the book was dedicated to and if this person is a celebrity of, of sorts, an important person, then you may criticize a book but only indirectly because you don't want to offend the person whose name is associated with this book. And normally this kind of lecture will go this way, almost inevitably will go this way. Oh, you, the person I'm dedicating the book to, you are so important, you are so bright, you have so many qualities, you're so excellent that yes, I'm offering this book to you, but this book is nothing. Because this book is everything that I could create. For me, the person who writes, this book is the crown of my career, of my intellectual life. However, compared to your qualities, this book is nothing, it's such a small, uh, puny gift. So please forgive me and please be generous, be gentle, be kind, accept this book. Because I know that this book is not worth it, I'm not worth it, but you, in your generosity and magnanimity, can accept this book. This is how it goes normally. However, this is how Machiavelli will turn this into a logical exercise that illuminates his mindset when it comes to anything even something as trivial is as, it, as this is a book that I'm giving to you, that I'm offering to you as a gift. Please accept it, okay? So Machiavelli will say, it is customary in most instances, where you see in most instances already tells you that you can never say always, you can never say never. There is always an exception, you can observe reality, right? It is, is a factual premise. You can always observe reality and find patterns. However, no pattern will absorb 100% of the phenomena. So no matter what I tell you in politics as well, it can only be considered true to a degree, to an extent, okay? There is no absolute truth, not even when you restrict your observation to a context, you cannot predict the outcome with 100% certainty. Okay. It is customary in most instances for those. So you see another specification. It's not just saying something universal about giving a book, offering a book to an important person. It's saying that in most instances that is, and it is so for a group of people those who desire to acquire favor with a prince, which is very interesting. Because place that in the context of Machiavelli, fired from his previous important position in the state of Florence, trying to boost, trying to restart his political and administrative diplomatic career. And that is the context of the book right? I don't want to honor you. I want to acquire favor, meaning you read this book, you Medici aristocrat, you read this book, and the first thing you think is, I want to have the author of this book as my consigliere, as my consultant, as my tactician, right? Because this book is the product of a mind that should be put to work, okay? It is customary to come before him, and then, once again, all the various possibilities are branched out. With those things I'm under possession that they hold most, most dear, the people who offer the book, or in which they see him delight the most. So, Either I offer something that is precious to me, or I offer something that is precious to you, the prince. 
and you see this constant application of different points of view. Hence, the first logical conclusion, one sees, above all, practice, experience, observation of reality, not the universal laws of the intellectual analysis of politics or anything else, but always the result of empirical knowledge. One sees many times, not always, many times, that princes are presented with horses, arms, cloth of gold, etc., etc., worthy of their greatness. Therefore, second conclusion that is more specific, since I desire to offer, this is my particular context, Machiavelli's context, offer myself to your magnificence. For the second time, Machiavelli is hinting, this book is secondary, it's just an instrument to me resuming my political career. It's like saying, this book is my portfolio. This book is my resume. Read it, value what I have to offer in the book and understand what I can offer in real life, okay? With some evidence of my devotion to you, why was Machiavelli fired when the Medicis came back to Florence? Because he had worked for the previous administration of the so-called Republic of Florence and his loyalty was being questioned, right? Can you work for the Republic and then work for the Dukes of Florence, as the Medicis will become soon after Machiavelli was fired? Eh. So you see the book under a different light once you understand these passages. Since I have not found among my valuables, which means I do have something that is valuable, anything that I hold more dear or estimate so highly as the understanding of the deeds of great men, right? I'm not telling the stories of great men. I'm presenting to you the understanding that is to say, Machiavelli is saying this book is about unpacking historical examples to extrapolate from the analysis of those examples political laws. The deeds of great men, which I have learned through, and again, more specifications. Long experience of modern things. Machiavelli has been working actively for 13 or 14 years at that point in politics. And constant readings about the ancient books. So he has an intellectual knowledge of history. He has a direct experience of historical events. These I have with great diligence, over a long time, thought out and examined. You see in how many ways Machiavelli is specifying the circumstances of this transaction. It's not simply, I have a book, it's a beautiful book, please accept it, although you are worth much more than this book is worth. No, is trying to set up this in the same way he will set up the political scenarios of the rest of the book by using the circumstances to specify how unique this context really is. And it's interesting that he, he presents two verbs. One is thought out, but in the Italian is escogitate. And escogitato, escogitare, was a new verb in this kind of context for the Italian language, which contains, as a base word, cogitare, which is the higher level of thinking in Latin, and ex, which is out of. So escogitare means not simply to see the truth in what I read, but to extract some kind of truth through a process of analysis, through a long process of exam and examined. So examined would be the observation, escogitare would be the end of the process 
of thinking applied to the pages of history or the experience of history, and now reduced into a small volume, which is a typical uh, Renaissance kind of goal. The idea that finally, that the intellectual is someone who will absorb and study many, uh, a lot of data from, from books, from the uh, reflection and observation of historical facts, and then will summarize everything in a book short enough that the experience and the work of many years by that intellectual can come to you, the reader, in a package that allows you within a short time to get to the same level of understanding of things. And I send them to your magnificent. What is the core content of this book? Notice it starts by saying, although I judge this work unworthy of presentation to you, which is typical, unworthy because you are a leader and you're a leader because you're so great. Okay? Does Machiavelli believe that? No, but it's very pragmatic, right? A leader is a leader. So there is no point in saying you're a leader, but you shouldn't be a leader. What does it mean you shouldn't be a leader? Because you don't have the qualities, you don't have the skills, you don't have the stamina to stay in power. That's meaningless. Machiavelli is pragmatic. If you're a leader, it means something. You may not be the leader for a very long time, but right now you're the leader, so there is no question in that at all. Although I judge this work unworthy of presentation to you, nonetheless, I bold, bold it nonetheless because that is a typical adverb conjunction by Machiavelli that always introduces additional specifications, right? Where Machiavelli says, yes, this is true, but, and what follows is the most important thing. I very much trust that on account of your humanity, it may be accepted considering how, etc., etc., and you can see all the modifications. And the important part is this one about the style, where Machiavelli says, my book is not about the beauty of the words, the beauty of the sentences, because this is a book about reality. And it's also a way to suggest this is a strong book. And it is a strong book, one that says, the victims of Cesare Borgia, those who were killed by Cesare Borgia through betrayal and deceit, are stupid. Are stupid because they're losers, because they should not have trusted some, the, the, the man who uh, trapped them and had them killed. Okay, certainly a different kind of book. And then, of course, you find in here the metaphor of the mountains and the plain, the different point of view. In order to understand the princes, you need to be a citizen. In order to understand the citizens, you need to be a prince, etc. And the conclusion will be, please find me something to do, right? Put me at work, right? Yes. I want you to be great, but notice the last, the last sentence. You will recognize from this book how undeservedly I endure a great and continuous malignity of fortune, which is just a, an indirect, very literary, very polite way of saying I'm unemployed. I'm here in my farms in Sant'Andrea and I should be working as a diplomat, as a high-ranking administrator, right? I don't deserve to be kept in this kind of situation for long. Chapter one and chapter two, let's do them in five minutes. However, in the meantime, I will also circulate the attendance so you don't have to spend too much time later lining up to sign. Title of chapter one, how many kinds of principalities there are and in what manner they are acquired. 
and this is a very short chapter, full of the same bifurcations that are a bit harder to find in the first text, the letter. In here, they're very clear. And it's just another way of saying, I cannot give you a book about politics in general, because everything I can say about politics has to keep in mind the circumstances beginning with the nature of an institution. And, it's, and, and Machiavelli goes through a series of scenarios just to let you understand as a general premise that each situation, each context comes with different laws. All states, <coughs> all dominions that have had and do have and Already you see that you have two forms of government, a state, which is more organized, a dominion, which is the result of the leadership of someone who takes charge, and you have references to the past, to the present, and what is power? Power is command over men. This is where you get the idea that I introduced earlier, that power for Machiavelli means control. And control, of course, the most direct form of control is controlling other people involved in a game. However, I specified, don't be distracted, don't pay attention just to this, because it is more correct to say that control, to have control in a Machiavellian game means to have control of the outcome. And in order to control the outcome, usually you have to control other people involved. But the goal is not the control of other people, because uh, in, otherwise you wouldn't understand what the game is about, right? The game is not about obedience. The game is about something else, right? Which is why the USSR, the Soviet Union, lost the Cold War. The Soviet Union had perfect control over their citizenry, right? Their citizens were completely obedient. Of course, there were dissidents, but most of them were ineffective or they were captured, arrested, sent to a gulag. However, the goal for the Soviet Union was practically to have control over their citizens and possibly over other states, and they lost because in, in, in Machiavelli's view, the goal is to generate resources, to keep society productive enough to generate the resources that the prince will need for his game of control. If you have complete obedience by your citizens in a non-productive society, because the Soviet Union was minimally productive, right? Uh, the, 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 the average income in the Soviet Union was probably under $3,000 when it was 25,000 in the United States in the, the 1960s and 70s right, just to give you a sense of the scale. So, command over men have been and are either republics or principalities. And then it goes through various specifications that a principality can be hereditary or it can be new. And the new can be completely new and provides an example. Or they can be partially new, where something new is added to something that is old. And what is the value of this again? It's not like you have to remember everything. It's just to understand that what Machiavelli is saying is that every context is different from another. You have to look closely at the circumstances in order to understand the ecosystem of a game and goes on and on through these specifications. And in two words, what is chapter two about? It is about influence, influence and time. Chapter two is about the notion of influence, about the fact that a dominion, a government that lasts a very long time in a place, he makes the example of Ferrara in Italy, gains a form of power that is influence. That is to say, you don't have to use a lot of resources to remain in power because the very fact that you have been the leadership, your family have been leaders, of that particular city-state for generations grants you an indirect form of power, which is what we call influence. And this is where I will stop.